Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, can you hear me? Sorry. Further closer. Could you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning to you, to you all, dear friends, and uh, it's my pleasure to take the floor this morning. I've been requested to speak about the future of WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization in Africa. But before I do that, I think it's only proper on your behalf to once again uh, maybe extend a word of condolences to our South African host on the passing of uh, the president, Nelson Mandela, uh, a great leader. And uh, like uh, Wallace Oinka said, he is uh, the soul of Africa. So having done that, I want now to engage you on this subject about the future of WIPO in Africa. But let me reassure you, uh, most of the things that have been said already this morning are relevant to the subject that I'm going to be talking on. And uh, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. The future will be what we all want it to be. You, meaning the various stakeholders here, and WIPO. So it's an invite to a joint partnership. I know that they are here, representatives of member states, of regional organization, of civil society, of universities, and so on and so forth. So the future will be the result of the engagement that we will be having over the years to come. From the very, at the outset, let me say that this question of WIPO's future in Africa, I will place it in the context of the notion of IP for development. IP for development, in other words, asking myself, to which extent can, and this has already been alluded to this morning by Tobias, can IP be used as a power tool to unlock and leverage Africa's human capacity in the field of IP, uh, relating to innovation and technologies, culture, commerce, and so forth. IP for development, it's a concept that emphasizes the idea that IP is not in any for itself. IP can contribute directly or indirectly to boosting production, raising income levels, and generating employment. But it can also do more to support the efforts by the least developed countries, LDCs, and developing countries. It can help in achieving the Millennium Development Goals and now what we call the post-2015 goals, the Sustainable Development Goals. So we will see the extent to which WIPO, as an intergovernmental organization, which is responsible for promoting and ensuring the protection of IP through international cooperation, to what extent WIPO can contribute to this process in Africa. I believe that this can only be really um, grasped through a, the, the twin concept of leadership and relevance. For white people to, 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 to be really at the center of the future of intellectual property in Africa, it will have to address and to take on those two, uh, two concepts. Leadership, because, and that has been said over, to, over and again today, the field of IP has been transformed in an unprecedented manner given the advance of globalization, the convergence between ICT and the telecommunication revolution. All these elements have led to a, a transformation in the field of IP. Traditional concepts no longer are always valid. Um, um, 
the business models have changed, and even the content of some of the IP works are now also changing. So the extent to which uh, WIPO can contribute to engaging Africa will depend to a large extent on its ability to continue to assert its leadership. But in so doing, it also should endeavor to remain relevant. <coughs> Relevance to the extent that it is able to address the issues that are critical to development of the countries. At the center of this is the concept of a balanced IP system. This morning there was a reference to the idea of public interest versus private interest. WIPO takes the approach that the IP system for Africa, for the developing countries, should be a system that balances those interests. So in the galaxies of the policies, the, the projects, the services that WIPO deploys in order to assist its member countries, particularly developing and least developed countries, there is one that is critical. It's emanate from the development agenda process, and it is the, the concept of IP for development. Just to make the presentation easy, I have prepared some diagrams, two diagrams, that I hope will enable me maybe to simply uh, synthesize the development that I may not have enough time to make here. So basically, I have this diagram and this, uh, the second one. Now, reverting to the first one, I am going to talk really more about the, the bottom right angle of the diagram where it is indicated IP for development, mainstreaming IP in national development. Of course, all the other angles are relevant. To do so, IP has to remain, uh, WIPO has to remain a premier global IP forum and institution, and I will see very quickly how that is done. And WIPO is playing a role in the progressive development of the laws in, and ensuring that there's respect for IP law. Again, there is this cycle around, which is really designed to show that there is some interrelationship, interconnection between the different angles. Of the, of the triangles, and there you have reference to national and regional perspective this morning. There was an emphasis on the fact that one size doesn't fit all, and that we should endeavor to contextualize IP in order to be better responsive to the set of circumstances that prevail in each and every country. Therefore, there's a reference to national and regional perspective. I see Director General Aripo here. And uh, so that's important. And then there's a reference to the WIPO as the premier global IP service, meaning I, I, WIPO is a service provider and the resources, financial resources that uh, enable the organization to assist actually are accrued through the registration services. So, just time-wise, I don't know, I'm fine, okay. So, I'll take you quickly through some of these um, elements. And uh, the first concept is the idea of uh, WIPO being an intergovernmental institution. Uh, I don't need to talk a lot about it. You're quite familiar with the organization, it's working, and so on and so forth. The WIPO journey, starting from 19th century with the two conventions, all the way to Marrakesh Treaty recently with certain milestones in 1970, WIPO becoming an organization, uh, meaning the WIPO Convention, signed in 67, but entering into force in 70, and then a number of other important treaty in the, in the, on the journey. IP is cross-cutting, so it touches on all sectors, and therefore, WIPO as an organization is bound to develop itself as a forum for discussions of these very critical issues. Now, issues relating to 
the intersection between IP and other public policy issues in the health sector, in the climate change, protection of environment, food security, and an effort is made to develop practical solutions. We will see how in the context of the development agenda to leverage innovation. There was a lot of talk during the, the debates, uh, the first debate this morning about the innovation. WIPO has developed a number of tools through the development agenda that enable it to provide assistance to developing countries in order to begin to be more practical about the issue of mastering um, technology, accessing knowledge, and supporting innovation. I was saying that this is an engagement among all the partners, the outreach of WIPO towards the different component of society that will help us to shape the future of the organization in, in um, Africa. I would not say much about the progressive development of IP law and building respect for the law, because I believe these issues will be touched upon during the, the week. I mentioned the need for a balance between the competing interest of public versus uh, private uh, uh, sector. Uh, the flexibility is very important because countries have to customize the laws to suit their own sets of circumstances. There have to be exceptions and limitations that are really responsive to the needs of the country. So some of these issues are discussed within WIPO in the context of you know, a number of organs existing in the organizations, standing committees, you are well familiar with those, standing committee for patents, standing committee for trademarks, for copyrights and related rights, and so on and so forth. They lead the discussion. Oh, I'm shown already that I have five minutes left. So let me maybe move on quickly. Uh, WIPO is a provision of premier global services that you know the income comes from services which are given. WIPO development agenda, the only reason why, <clears throat> maybe I should revert just to make the, the, bear with me one second, and I will just maybe try to go and wrap up in five minutes. Now, if we go to the bottom right corner, IP for development, mainstreaming of IP in national developments, maybe a, no, a set of consideration have to be borne in mind. Number one, it is important to engage the countries, and that's where we see our value in terms of relevance, to have a more integrated approach to, to IP as opposed to a standalone, to have a strategy to bring about, because IP being inter, meaning uh, interdepartmental, to bring them around the table to discuss IP issues. So the way we do it, and we're engaging more and more countries, is to help them to develop IP strategies and policies, whereby they can, around a table with the assistance of the organization, international consultant, national consultants, and so on and so forth, through stakeholder committees, which are, of course, uh, cross, cross section, discuss the interrelationship between the various aspects of IP and public policy that will bear on the development process. And in the process, help them to agree on a framework that will enable them to be better responsive to their development challenges. So in other words, the document that is finally adopted by the country, that is the plan, will not be uh, similar to the one adopted in, in, a, in a neighboring country. Each country has to, first of all, uh, take stock of its own, meaning make a need assessment, take stock of its own, of its own um, national assets, and then develop a strategy that is designed to maximize the return and use IP as a lever to bring about the changes. And there are many illustrations. If you take Ethiopia, for instance, they have developed a strategy emphasizing innovation, but also emphasizing you know, uh, the use of uh, origin-linked 
uh, origin linked um, signs like branding in order to promote the, 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 the agricultural production. That's one thing that is being done by more, by more and more countries. What is important for countries is to realize that they have to take stock of the situation, design a strategy, agree, and the strategy may cover things like institutional building, and that's why you have the, the IP for development house here. You have at the bottom stakeholder consultative committee, need assessment, desk review, and then you have the bricks that may or may not be there for the house to hold together. And the, the bricks are a function of the sets of circumstances in the country. A country that wants to emphasize innovation will use a number of platforms developed by WIPO. Uh, TISC, the Technology Innovation Support Center, I don't have enough time to talk about it. It's a major initiative launched during, in the context of the development agenda. It helps countries to access knowledge relating to technology, access to a specialized database, RD and ASP, and so on and so forth. It may also rely on certain technologies and database, WIPO green technologies, if there's an interest in uh, protection of environment, uh, tech transfer, appropriate technologies, and so on and so forth. It may also emphasize the strengthening of the office, modernization, using the IPAS. It may think of enforce, um, reinforcing building national capacity, human capacity. Therefore, you have National IP Academy. Those are initiative of development agenda, and so on and so forth. What is important at the end of the day is that the plan, the strategy, should really suit the set of circumstances prevailing in the country. Now, this approach has been taken in many countries already, and many countries have a blueprint, development blueprint, uh, Rwanda 20, 2020, uh, Uganda 2030, and so on and so forth. And in those countries, because of the existence of those blueprint, we are able to easily identify the priority areas that require some thinking from the standpoint of the users of IP and to see the extent to which we can take IP as a tool to enable them to realize some of the, some of the um, goals that have been uh, pinpointed in the, in the development blueprint. Now, we have done this much successfully in a number of countries, Kenya, Uganda, uh, Rwanda, Cameroon, and so on and so forth. So I, I see that time is short, and I cannot say. <laughs> so these countries, this process is an ongoing process. And what is important for us uh, in the organization is simply to continue to engage the different players. And when I say countries, you should think beyond the state. In each country, there's a stakeholder committee consisting of a wide gamut of all the relevant players, users, and producers of, uh, of wealth in the country. The important thing is to bring them to understand that IP should not be approached in isolation. It should be seen as a, as a strategic tool that needs the, the input of all the relevant sectors. So this is one way that WIPO hopes to continue to assert its uh, leadership and its relevance in Africa in the years to come. And uh, of course, your respective contribution will be most welcome to this process. And I thank you.